Hi y'all, it's me again, Mother Nancy, continuing with our Episcopal 101 video series, and I'm so excited that today we get to talk about the Book of Common Prayer. And I have to admit and prepare y'all just a little bit that I'm a little bit nerdy about this book. I love it. And I hope that what I share with you will help you learn more about the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement. And even if you've been an Episcopalian your whole life, that you will come to see it in a new way. Not just as some ancient dusty book we keep in the back of our pews because they've just always been there, but as an expression of our faith past and present as the tool it's intended to be to shape our lives daily as we follow Jesus. Now the official title of the book is The Book of Common Prayer and Administration of the Sacraments and Other Rites and Ceremonies of the Church together with the Psalter or Psalms of David, according to the use of the Episcopal Church. But that is just way too long for anybody to say. So mostly we just call it the BCP. We call it common because one, it contains the fixed texts of the regular services for the church used for common worship, meaning public or regular worship. And two, it uses the vernacular, or the common language, spoken by most people. Now the first Book of Common Prayer, if y'all remember from the history video, was published in 1549 by Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. He and his committee of twelve drew from ancient prayers of Judaism and Roman Catholic and Orthodox traditions as well as rituals of the Middle Ages and emerging rites and prayers of the Reformed traditions. The first BCP in the Episcopal Church of the United States was published in 1789, and there have been three revisions since, 1892, 1928, and 1979. The BCP is the closest thing we have in the Episcopal Church to any official book of doctrine. And we believe that the principles of our faith are formed in us through the regular practices and worship presented in the BCP. So if you have your own BCP and know where it is, press pause and go get it. I'll wait here. If you don't have one of your own, I highly encourage you to get one. You can get it through most any bookseller, or you can look at it online at bcponline.org. And if you're clever enough to look at the online version and keep this video going, I raise my coffee cup to you because you are way smarter than I am. People sometimes get the impression that we put greater stock in the BCP than we do in the Bible. But the truth is that the vast majority of the words used in the BCP come from Scripture, and all of our forms of worship and prayer are grounded in the Word of God. When the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray, He didn't suggest that they just make it up as they go along. He offered them a prescribed form that we call the Lord's Prayer. And this doesn't dismiss the use of extemporaneous prayer. But it does emphasize the importance of the words we use. Words are powerful. God spoke all things into being. Words create and words can destroy, and so we need to be careful with how we use them. Our prayers and our prayer book connect us to the voices of believers in times past, around the world, and in times yet to come. So before we continue into the book itself, I want to talk briefly about this connection to something bigger than ourselves. The Episcopal Church is a member of the Anglican Communion. 38 autonomous national and regional churches, which are in communion, meaning in reciprocal relationship with, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the Communion's spiritual head. There's no Anglican central authority such as a pope. And each national or regional church makes its own decisions in its own ways, guided by the conferences and councils and the fellow leaders within the Anglican Communion. 
and each of these national or regional churches uses a form of the Book of Common Prayer constructed in their language and for their culture. I found this really great quote by the Right Reverend Daniel Martins, Bishop of Springfield, on the importance of belonging to this communion. And I quote, The Anglican Communion is absolutely vital to our identity as Episcopalians. It calls us out of ourselves and our time-bound and place-bound needs and perceptions. It resources our life of worship and devotion as we drink from the font of accumulated centuries of Christian experience long before the gospel even reached these shores. Our communion with the ancient sea of Canterbury is the primary means by which we connect to the great Catholic tradition that, Episcopal, that historic episcopate by which we remain faithful to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship. Without the Anglican Communion, the Episcopal Church would be just one more obscure boutique American sect. It's not an optional extra, but it is the essence of who we are." End quote. And I'll put a, a link to the full text where I found that quote in the comments section below so you can read the whole thing. The regular use of the Book of Common Prayer is our ongoing reminder to this connection. And so here's some really cool things to know about the BCP. It comes in various forms. You can get hardbound or leatherbound, large or small. There's different colors, and you can even get versions with the Bible or the hymnal included, or even a Kindle version if you choose. And whichever version you have, the page numbers are always the same. So whether you are using it in Texas, or New York, or California, or Minnesota, or Alaska, or Hawaii, or wherever, in worship and prayer, you are always on the same page as Episcopalians everywhere. Just keep in mind, for your own eyesight, that to keep the pages the same, they either need to reduce or enlarge the print, depending on the dimensions of the book. The BCP is not copyrighted. The contents can be used by anyone, anytime. And each edition is certified by the custodian of the Standard Book of Common Prayer. This person is nominated by the House of Bishops and confirmed by the House of Deputies. And the custodian is responsible for the maintenance of the text of the BCP and the recording of any alterations made at General Convention. It's my dream job. Just after the title page in every BCP, is the certification page ensuring its authenticity. Okay, so if you have your prayer book, get it out and let's just look at the table of contents. I want us to walk through the layout of it because the layout of the BCP is very intentional. It reflects the order and cycle of God's creation, our lives as we are to live them, and each year as it comes. So following the ratification and the preface, we have the calendar of the church year, and we'll talk more about that later. But for now, let's start with the section titled, The Daily Office. And contrary to how it may sound, this is not some agenda of how your local clergy are to spend their day. But it is the daily rhythm of prayer and scripture that we are all to use all of our days. The daily office evolved from the ancient Jewish and early Christian practice of setting aside specific times of the day, every day, for daily devotions, reading of scripture, and prayers to God. And here's something really cool. Anyone can lead the daily office. You don't need a clergy person for it. There are instructions or rubrics given in italics to guide you. And you don't have to be sitting in a church. You can do the daily office in your favorite chair, on your front porch, 
or even in your local coffee shop with your friends or your family, wherever and with whoever and however it works in your daily routine. There's also a shorter version of the daily office titled Daily Devotions for Individuals and Families. And since the daily office is to be the regular pattern and rhythm of our life and continuous prayer, it is significant that it comes first in the BCP. And so next we find the Great Litany. This comes from the first English language rite prepared by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. And it can be incorporated into the daily offices and the Holy Eucharist. And many congregations make use of it during the season of Lent. The collects, both traditional and contemporary, are prayers of a particular structure used in Christian liturgies. And a collect generally has five parts. The invocation or address the acknowledgement, a description of a divine attribute that relates to the petition, the petition, what we're asking for, the aspiration, the desired result of our petition, and the pleading, a conclusion indicating the mediation of Jesus Christ in all of our prayers. And next we move through the proper liturgies for special days beginning with Ash Wednesday, which begins the season of Lent. Then we have Palm Sunday, followed by the Holy Week services for Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and the Great Vigil of Easter. These services celebrate the foundation of our faith, that God would come to us through the Son Jesus and would suffer and die for us so that as he conquered death by rising again, we would be reconciled with God to live a new life here and now. The next service in the book is Holy Baptism, when new Christians are fully initiated into the faith community, the beginning of their new life in Christ. And only after our foundation is laid and we are brought into the faith does our BCP turn to the regular patterns of worship for Sundays through the year titled the Holy Eucharist? Eucharist means Thanksgiving. And after all the forms of Holy Eucharist, we have what's called the pastoral offices, those special events that mark our lives in and through Christ, confirmation, marriage, ministry to the sick, and burial of the dead. You can even read the ordination services for bishop, bishops, priests, and deacons. We are a very community-oriented and transparent church. We have no secret or private worship. There's also the complete book of Psalms and the section of special prayers and thanksgivings for every conceivable situation. Our outline of faith is toward the back, but don't let that lead you to believe it's insignificant. It is an excellent source of information about the basics of our belief. And finally, the historical documents show the path of our faith through the years. And they're not hidden in the back, but part of the cycle that returns us to the beginning, that keeps us grounded, remembering where we came from as we continue to journey with Jesus in the way of love. That was a lot of information, and we haven't even turned past the table of contents yet. So before we jump into greater detail about the various services and other cool things we do in the Episcopal Church, let's take a break. I need some more coffee.